Hello, I'm Bobby Jean Schweitzer, and I'm presenting Anesthesia for Ambulatory Surgery, Part 2. So the lecture module will consist of important comorbidities. Let's start with a question. A 19-year-old with a history of severe asthma is scheduled for an umbilical hernia repair. What is the best intervention on the day of surgery to prevent bronchospasm in a patient with asthma? A giving hydrocortisone 100 milligrams IV in the preoperative holding area, B, an inhalational induction of general anesthesia, C, a beta agonist inhaler nebulizer preoperatively, or D, inhale steroids preoperatively. And the answer is giving beta agonist inhaler or nebulizer preoperatively. Answer C is correct because beta agonists delivered via inhalation have rapid onset and a good safety profile. Answer C is incorrect because hydrocortisone is not immediately effective. Answer B is incorrect because even though inhalational agents can uh, be bronchodilators, they can initially cause bronchoconstriction due to their noxious nature. Answer D is incorrect because inhaled steroids are not immediately effective. Uh, let's talk about uh, some various comorbidities. Uh, let's start with cardiac disease, since that is a more common, um, uh, both condition patients have and a common um, associated cause of comorbidity, of, of complications, excuse me. So you should delay non-emergency surgery for the following conditions. A patient who has decompensated heart failure, and that is defined as new onset heart failure, heart failure with symptoms at rest, heart failure with worsening symptoms, or patients with severe valvular disease, such as symptomatic critical aortic or mitral stenosis. Um, and you should delay non-emergency surgery for the following conditions as well. Those patients who have significant arrhythmias, defined as high-grade atrioventricular block, such as third degree or complete heart block, Mobitz type two blocks, symptomatic bradycardias, symptomatic ventricular arrhythmias, and symptomatic supraventricular arrhythmias um, or those with uncontrolled ventricular rates. You should also delay non-emergency surgery for the following um, condition um, related to ischemic heart disease. Um, unstable coronary syndromes, which is defined as um, a myocardial infarction within the last 60 days, unstable angina, new onset angina, or chest pain at rest. So if dual antiplatelet therapy must be interrupted or there is a significant chance of bleeding with continued dual antiplatelet therapy, then surgery should be delayed for a minimum of two weeks after balloon angioplasty, four to six weeks after bare metal stents, six months after drug eluding stents. And this is a new recommendation since 2016. And 30 days after coronary artery bypass grafting. Aspirin is typically continued for most ambulatory surgery patients in patients who do have um, coronary stents or significant coronary artery disease. Um, uh, hypertension is a common condition in patients undergoing surgery, and patients should uh, typically be, do, be directed to take all of their antihypertensive medications on the, delay, on the day of surgery, with the possible exception of withholding angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers for 12 to 24 hours preoperatively if there's a high risk of hypotension. Beta blockers should definitely be taken on schedule. If patients have reasonable control, uh, defined as a systolic blood pressure of less than 180 millimeters of mercury, or a diastolic blood pressure defined as less than 110 millimeters of mercury, then those patients are reasonable candidates to proceed with surgery. There was a meta-analysis of 30 observational studies showing that there was little increased risk in patients who had um, hypertension with an odds ratio of 1.3 for perioperative cardiac um, adverse events. They uh, defined that there was, they stated there was little evidence for an association of complications with preoperative systolic blood pressures of less than 180 millimeters of mercury or diastolic blood pressures of less than 110 millimeters of mercury. Um, there was less clear evidence uh, for recommendations with preoperative blood pressures above this level. 
There was more perioperative ischemia, arrhythmias, and cardiovascular liability in patients who did have poorly controlled hypertension, but there was no clear evidence that deferring anesthesia or surgery reduced risk. So asthma should be well controlled and patients should be free of wheezing. A short course of steroids before surgery to achieve this goal should be considered in patients who are not optimally controlled. Uh, typically 60 milligrams of prednisone daily for approximately three days can be beneficial. One should continue asthma medications. Inhaled beta-2 agonists and anticholinergics should definitely be taken on schedule up until the time of, of surgery. Uh, remember, that re airway reactivity persists for several weeks after an exacerbation of asthma. What about the intraoperative management of asthma? Well, one should ensure that there's adequate anesthesia before instrumenting the airway. One should consider administering one milligram per kilogram with a maximum of 100 milligrams of lidocaine uh, before intubation and extubation. Volatile agents are typically favored over opioids because they promote bronchodilation. One should repeat nebulizer treatments hourly if signs of bronchospasm are present, and one can add anticholinergics to beta-2 agonists. Um, one, should, one should typically ventilate the patient with tidal volumes of 6 cc's per kilogram with a longer IDE ratio with allowing more time for expiration. One should consider extubating the patient deep, regional anesthesia, or use of a supraglottic airway and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation has advantages, when possible, over endotracheal intubations. Minimizing COPD risk is slightly different than asthma. Unlike asthmatics, patients with COPD typically tolerate induction of anesthesia and anesthesia, but have difficulties in the post-operative period. These patients can benefit from regional anesthesia, the use of supraglottic airways, and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation whenever possible. One should optimize patient positioning and ensure reversal of neuromuscular uh, blockade before extubating the patient. Smokers have an increased risk of perioperative complications. Prolonged abstinence significantly decreases postoperative respiratory complications. Six months of abstinence typically restores antimicrobial and alveolar macrophage function, but smoking cessation for as little as six to eight weeks improves pulmonary function and decreases the risk of cardiovascular complications. Three weeks of abstinence reduces impaired wound healing, and, but there is no robust data uh, to support that smoking cessation in the short term actually increases pulmonary complications, though it may possibly increase secretions. If there is a in slight increased risk of pulmonary complications with short-term smoking cessation, this is far outweighed by the improved benefits of, of smoking cessation on wound healing, the reduction of infections, and the improvement in cardiovascular outcomes. So all patients should be encouraged to stop smoking even a day before surgery. One day of abstinence reduces nicotine because the half-life is only about one hour. One day of abstinence reduces carboxyhemoglobin. The half-life is typically about four hours. One day of abstinence improves tissue oxygen delivery. And one day of abstinence halves the risk of ischemia and infarction in patients with coronary artery disease. Here's another question. A 48-year-old male presents to your ambulatory surgery center for an elective knee arthroscopy. He reports that he had an episode of chest pain about two and a half months ago and had a cardiac catheterization, but does not know if stents were placed. He has been asymptomatic since. Which situation would preclude his proceeding with surgery today? A, he received a drug-eluting stent. B, he received a bare metal stent. C, if he had significant coronary artery disease, but he refused stenting. D, if he underwent angioplasty without stenting. And the answer is A, if he received a drug-eluting stent just two and a half months ago, that would be an absolute contraindication to an elective uh, procedure, even in an inpatient surgery center, or inpatient setting, excuse me. So answer A is correct because the American College of Cardiology American Heart Association guidelines from 2014 recommend that dual antiplatelet therapy, I'm sorry, from 2016, recommend that dual antiplatelet therapy be continued for a minimum of three months and ideally for six months after placement of drug-eluting stents. Answer B is incorrect because the ACCHA guidelines 
um, are to continue dual antiplatelet therapy for a minimum of 30 days after placement of bare metal stents. Answer C is incorrect because there is no contraindication to proceeding with low-risk surgery in a patient with stable angina. And answer D is incorrect because the ACCHA guidelines recommend uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for just a minimum of two weeks after angioplasty if no stent placement occurred. So studies have found that it, it, there is increased risk of venous stasis, pulmonary embolism, wound infections, positioning injuries, namely nerve palsies, and postoperative pneumonia in obese patients. Obesity-related comorbidities such as obstructive sleep apnea, hypertension, or diabetes appear to increase risk in obese patients rather than merely their body mass index alone. There is a significantly higher prevalence of comorbidities in obese um, children, sorry, that should say in obese children, um, such as asthma, hypertension, sleep apnea, type 2 diabetes. There's also a higher incidence of difficult mask ventilation, airway obstruction, major oxygen desaturation defined by a greater than 10% drop of ba from baseline, and critical respiratory adverse events. GERD also uh, is, it has an increased association with obesity. However, obesity alone has not been shown to increase the risk of perioperative aspiration. Supraglottic airways should not typically be utilized when there is an increased aspiration risk, such as high-risk patients um, defined as those with significant GERD or heartburn, those with esophageal dysmotility or achalasia, and high-risk surgery, such as those requiring prolonged steep Trendelenburg positioning. So if you're caring for uh, pregnant patients, you need to be aware that there are recommendations around fetal monitoring. Um, if, there's, if fetal monitoring is indicated, procedures should be done at facilities with neonatal and obstetric, obstetric services. A qualified person needs to be available to interpret the fetal heart rate. An obstetrician with C-section delivery privileges should be available if the fetus is considered viable. If the fetus is viable, fetal heart rate monitoring and contraction monitoring is indicated at a minimum before and after procedures. It is sufficient to ascertain fetal heart rate before and after procedures if the patient is pre-viable. So there's insufficient data to recommend a level of preoperative fasting blood glucose or hemoglobin A1C level above which ambulatory surgery should be postponed. Surgery is, should be postponed in patients with significant complications of hyperglycemia, such as severe dehydration, ketoacidosis, and hyperosmolar non-ketotic states. It may be acceptable to proceed with preoperative uh, hyperglycemia if long-term control is adequate. So patients with difficult airways pose a particular problem in the ambulatory surgery center if one does not uh, prepared and doesn't have appropriate resources available. Um, there appears to be the highest risk in office-based settings. So the American Society of Anesthesiologists has, have, have, uh, has a task force on perioperative management of patients with obstructive sleep apnea. The guidelines um, show that OSA is associated with obesity, pregnancy, and upper airway obstruction, it is, it all, but it excludes patients with pure central sleep apnea, airway abnormalities without apnea, daytime hyper hypersomnolence from other causes such, such as narcolepsy, or obesity without sleep apnea. And this guideline pertains to both inpatient and outpatient settings. They uh, have established a scoring guideline. Um, they, uh, you calculate an overall score, um, which includes information um, from the sleep study, if there is one available, um, and that's scored at a, a range of zero to three. Um, also, you take into consideration the extent of the surgery and the type of anesthesia, also scored at a range from zero to three, or the requirement for post-operative opioid use, also scored at a range of zero to three. A score of four may, uh, shows a patient who may be at increased perioperative risk from OSA, and a score of greater than four um, also uh, indicates a patient who may be at significantly increased um, perioperative risk uh, from OSA. 
So the pre-op scoring from a sleep study, um, if it is available, shows um, that one can um, uh, quantify risk based on the a AHI scoring, which is the apnea hypopnea index. Patients who have an AHI score of less than five are have considered at no risk, and those patients do not have sleep apnea. Patients with mild sleep apnea are typically those with an AHI of 5 to 15, and those get one point. Moderate OSA is an AHI of 16 to 30, and that's assigned two points. And those with severe OSA are assigned three points, and that is defined as an AHI of greater than 30. The graph shows you the associated risk of patients um, with various, uh, from, for various complications. So the extent of surgery is uh, classified as either superficial surgery under local or peripheral nerve block without sedation, which it, um, gets a zero points. Um, if it's superficial surgery with moderate sedation or general anesthesia, or peripheral surgery with a spinal or epidural anesthesia, a one point is assigned. Patients having peripheral surgery with general anesthesia or airway surgery with moderate sedation get two points. And those patients having major surgeries or airway surgeries with general anesthesia are assigned three points. And the post-operative opioid requirements are uh, zero for no opioid use, one for low-dose oral opioids, three for either high-dose um, oral or the administration of any parenteral or neuroaxial opioid. An alternative to the uh, ASA uh, scoring system is the use of the STOP-BANG scoring system. Stop bang is an acronym for uh, the S standing for snoring, um, but it's not just simply snoring. You should ask the patient if they snored loudly, uh, which is defined as louder than talking or loud enough to be heard through a closed door. The T is for tiredness. You should ask the patient if they feel tired, fatigued, or sleepy during the daytime. O for observed apnea. Um, this question is, it says anyone observed you sleep, stop breathing during your sleep. P is for pressure, which is actually for um, high blood pressure. Um, B is for BMI, for uh, and a BMI of greater than 35 um, is a positive. A is for age, and age greater than 50 is a positive. N is for neck circumference greater than 40 centimeters, and M is for male gender. Patients who score at uh, greater than three positive questions are at high risk for OSA, um, and the, those who score at greater or equal to five questions are not only at risk for OSA, but at risk for moderate to severe OSA. This is a, uh, a pictorial from the SAMBA, Society of Ambulatory Anesthesia Guidelines, which specifically applies to patients with OSA who are undergoing ambulatory surgery. And they recommend that one starts with a preoperative evaluation and then divide patients into those with either known OSA, which is on the right side of the graft, or those patients, or, sorry, the left side of the graft, or those patients who have presumptive diagnosis of OSA um, shown there on the right. So with patients, if patients have known OSA and they have optimized comorbid conditions and they have CPAP available and can use it after discharge, the recommendation is to proceed with ambulatory surgery. However, those patients with known OSA who have poorly um, or non-optimized comorbid conditions um, are not typically candidates for ambulatory surgery and may benefit from further diagnosis and treatment. If patients have presumptive diagnosis of OSA and have optimized comorbid conditions, and the postoperative pain can be managed predominantly by using non-opioid analgesics, then the recommendation is to proceed with ambulatory surgery. Those patients with presumptive diagnosis of OSA who have poorly controlled or non-optimized uh, comorbid con conditions are similar to those with, non, with known OSA, and the recommendation is, is that they should be delayed for further uh, diagnosis and treatment. So in those patients who are likely to require a blood transfusion, um, unless your center is prepared um, with blood, then uh, these are poor candidates to have a procedure in an ambulatory setting. Those patients um, are defined as those with severe anemia, patients with sickle cell disease, patients uh, undergoing procedures where there's a significant risk of blood loss, patients with a low platelet counts, hemophiliacs, or patients with known coagulopathies. Patients with liver disease um, 
um, can be at risk for perioperative uh, complications in those with significant or severe liver disease or poor candidates to be done in ambulatory surgery centers. Um, one can use the child's PU classification um, or a MEL scoring to uh, quantify a uh, patient's risk of, with liver disease. A child's PUC or a male score of greater than 15 indicates patients with elevated risk. Those patients with acute liver failure are at very high risk. Patients with acute alcoholic hepatitis are at very high risk. And patients with um, serum bilirubins of greater than 11. Um, certain surgeries carry a higher risk than other surgeries. And any abdominal surgery carries the, a higher risk than peripheral operations and those surgeries closest to the liver, such as cholecystectomies, carry the absolute highest risk. So how do you calculate a MEL score? Well, the easy way is to go to the web um, and uh, just type in calculating MEL scores or MEL scores, and you will typically uh, see a calculator um, that one can enter in um, three numbers, um, the patient's creatinine level, the patient's bilirubin level, and the patient's INR uh, level. The hard way is to have a logarithmic calculator and plug these numbers in yourself. So the, um, uh, b before we had male scoring, we used the child turcot pew classification, and this is still used um, in many studies to quantify risk. Um, one assigns one to three points um, for five different categories. Um, one uh, has to look at the bilirubin, and you can see the numbers there. The lower the bilirubin, the lower the point scores. Um, the higher the bilirubin, the higher the point scores. Albumin, um, the higher the albumin level, the lower the point scores. The lower the albumin, the higher the point scores. Um, one uses the PT here in seconds rather than the INR, um, though you can see some um, uh, uh, modifications here where they give you the INR as well as the PT. Again, any prolongation of the PT is associated with higher risk, higher number of points get assigned. The presence or absence of ascites um, also determines scoring, and the presence or ab absence of encephalopathy. One of the reasons why the, why the child turcot pew classification is often considered less reliable than the male is because of the subjective nature of assigning the presence or ab absence of ascites and encephalopathy. Um, you can see there at the bottom that a class A patient is that who has five to six points, a B patient is, is, has seven to nine points, and patients who have uh, 10 or more points are considered uh, class C patients. Class C patients are at the highest risk, class A patients are at the lowest risk. Thank you very much for your time.